Um, first of all, I know I don't normally ask questions during my sessions, but how many people are from banks or retail type outlets? Cool, brilliant, brilliant. Um, how many people are from what you would class as a fintech? Brilliant, thank you. How many people are sitting here because the other sessions are full? No, no. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm not a clicker. This is a problem when you uh, move over quite quickly. So um, as, uh, as the introduction said, thank you, Kashlani. Um, I'm Richard Smith. Uh, I'm an independent architect. Uh, generally, I do enterprise architecture um, and um, consultant, depending on whether I'm adding value or not, to be honest. Um, in recent years, I've provided uh, services within the financial industry. Um, in part, facilitating digital-related initiatives and uh, PST2 compliance. Um, these interactions have led to two organizations choosing to implement uh, WSO2 open banking solutions. What's wrong with this? <laughs> Which basically means that the, uh, the title's a lie. I didn't buy them. Obviously, the banks did. Um, yeah, so um, I also like the color orange, but that's not a good reason to choose WSO2. Honest, you know, we all like orange, but that's not a good reason. <laughs> Um, and obviously today, I'm uh, being asked to share my experiences. So here we go. Um, so who are WSO2? Now, it's a bit of a daft question to ask in this sort of room. I hope that, obviously, based on the cost of the tickets and that you've taken the afternoon out, that uh, you, you actually know who WSO2 are, and at least some of the points of which they actually provide. Um, but it came up in conversation last week. Uh, somebody g goes to me, who are WSO2? And I sort of had to turn around and say, mm, they're the people who are providing your API gateway. So yeah, a bit of an embarrassing conversation. Um, but it, it does come up. Um, you know, It seems that if you know who WSO2 are, you're in a bit of an exclusive club. Um, but at least Forrester seemed to recognize WSO2, and hopefully with more artifacts like this, I can stop having the questions of who WSO2 are. But how do you get WSO2 into a financial organization? I mean, financial organizations generally don't really like the whole risk. Why don't you just go to IBM or Dell or whoever? I get these questions all the time. And how, how did I discover WSO2? So to be honest, I didn't know who WSO2 even were till September 2, 2016. Um, I found myself unexpectedly with uh, nothing on at the time. I, uh, we had the Brexit vote, sterling, the value of sterling collapsed against the dollar. Uh, some work I had arranged with a client um, didn't come to fruition because they had their debt serviced in, in dollars, which was great, uh, which basically meant that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't able to start that project. I went to a meetup held by WSOT called the Future of Enterprise Integration, Microintegration. I didn't really know what to expect, to be honest. I didn't even know WSO2 were hosting it. But I learned a lot. I was very impressed. And obviously went to uh, follow uh, follow-up meetups afterwards. Um, in 2017, I picked up a financial services client. They were actually looking at digital transformation at the time. Um, whereby digital transformation, mainly from the client perspective, they're a traditional bank. They wanted to expand their digital presence, have an app and website is basically what the uh, board had said like all boards. Um, I had to look at a new target reference architecture to effectively facilitate digital. It was a, an organization where they'd obviously tightly coupled a load of customizations around their core banking system. So not great for digital. Um, and upon an, an analyzing the uh, gap between the current state and the target state, uh, it was obvious we needed to have a mix of legacy systems with new de digital technology platforms. Um, I ran a request a request for a proposal, WSO2, from my previous interaction at the meetups. I invited them along. Um, and yeah, we mixed them with some better known vendors. Now, obviously, this would be a really, really short um, session if they hadn't won that RFP process. So <laughs> suffice to say, they actually won. Uh, <laughs> but as I say, lucky otherwise. Um, although I can't go into any specifics, obviously, because of commercial sensitivities. Um, the reasons actually included commercials. Now, if, if anybody has to deal with commercial guys, make it cheap. Yeah, you're driving a Merc, but make it cheap. So, weirdly, with WSOT, comparing apples with apples, 
they gave us the cheapest quote. It's always good. Uh, proposed solution fit. Um, the apples they gave us were the right color of green and the right shape. All good. Confidence. The proposal had shown that it actually bothered to understand our requirements. It wasn't a rehashed proposal. It wasn't something that they'd sent to somebody before. It suggested they actually understood our requirements and were going to go beyond in what they were actually suggesting, which was great. Uh, their product alignment, as I say, was a very good fit for our target architecture. Um, they were aware of their competitive strength. I never forgive the guy who asked this question, but he basically turned around to WSO2 and all our other uh, vendors we had on the time and, t and said, where are XY, uh, yeah, X, Y, and Z competitors stronger than yourselves? WSO2 were the only company that felt confident they could actually answer it. They actually understood their competition. Um, and their approach, now I remember the commercial guy actually saying this, I like engineers, I like, I like companies that are run by engineers. That was great, that was easy. Um, but it was really the, the engineering was first, the sales were second. You knew that they were more pr proud of their product set than they were about trying to sell it to me, which was always good. So um, the approach to PS2 compliance and, and generally open banking um, was born for the greater digital strategy at that particular uh, organization. Um, although compliance would need to be achieved before we'd actually achieve digital transformation. So uh, I think that was probably the same situation a lot of banks faced in 2017. Um, we also found that actually our, call back, our online banking system at the time just wouldn't be able to support TPP interactions. We would have to cripple the security around it. Um, so it would be important that the, the approach we would take wouldn't compromise customer security or the security models of our current online banking system, which would have done if we'd opened up to TPPs. Uh, aligned to open standards, to aid in the development and delivery efforts, uh, did not hinder possible future migrations, even the possibility of actually replacing that platform. Now, look, I say I'm an enterprise architect by day. When I'm putting in a platform, I want to know I can move away from it afterwards and not disrupt my customers and everything else. Not that obviously I'd want to, but you, know, you never know. Um, contribute towards the new target operating uh, architecture, or uh, target reference architecture and enable further digital initiatives. I did not want to put things in that I was going to have to rip out as soon as we tried to start building new, uh, new services. Uh, Reutilise existing customer authentication artifacts. Um, creating the basis of a future SSO platform with minimal customer disruption. Um, obviously, when you're building out multiple digital channels, the last thing you want is the customers to have to have a username and password for every single one. You want a, a more holistic username and password platform. You want a holistic security model. Um, and provide compliance in regards to the bank's existing offerings. Um, obviously, when it comes to PST2, Back last year, open banking wasn't necessarily fully PS2 compliant, uh, but it was for the bank's offerings at the time. So, um, suffice to say, that actually went. That was a successful delivery. I haven't actually put that in the slide. I should have done really. Um, but at the start of 2018, another financial services client approached me to aid them in the technology deliverables associated with the PST2 directive. That's quite a dr dry line, really. Um, effectively. Second client, they didn't really want to do digital transformation at the time. They wanted a plug and play solution which would get them PST2 compliance, future SCA compliance without leveraging or having to call the open banking supplier um, who at the time they were trying to replace as well and having quite a bad relationship with. So um, at the, the starting point was obviously very different. This particular organization was not looking at um, digital transformation. They were looking at just compliance. But at, the, at that point in time also, 2017 was quite easy. There was a few parties. 2018, in January, every man and his dog were offering an apparent solution to PSD2. It's the same as, uh, did it, I mean, it's like GDPR compliance. You have companies coming up to you, oh, we can make you GDPR compliant. I had info blocks come up to me and go, oh, we can make you GDPR compliant. They're a DNS solution provider. Um, but you know, every man was basically going, yeah, I can give you a PSD2 solution. Brilliant. Gives me a lot more competition. Um, and many of those companies were actually hadn't got a banking client before anyway. Um, so they were willing to give very, very attractive commercials, which was the top priority, unfortunately, on this particular project. 
Um, but with acknowledgement that there might be a digital strategy in the future, look, Richard, if you can fit it in and it's cheap enough, yeah, do what you need to do. So, I'm going for this probably too quickly because I was compensating for Seshika's session. <laughs> I think I've caught up now. Um, so, obviously, number two, it was acknowledged by the client that the internal governance uh, will probably slow down the progress um, of the actual RF, the, the, our actual investigation into a suitable supplier. And uh, the fact we've got internal resource problems, so therefore it's probably going to hinder any sort of deployment. So it really was get to an RFQ process, get an apples for apples comparison, so the business can then use its slow governance to try and catch up afterwards, and please get on a provider that can actually do everything. That'd be brilliant. Um, I won't, won't go through the, all the details, but suffice to say, WS2 were actually one of the two prevent, uh, vendors which actually won the RFQ contest. Brilliant. Um, the only thing that WS2 didn't pick up in the RFQ contest was the um, uh, hard tokens, effectively, for some of our non-mobile customers. So I can't really go into specifics, but they're the same as the last time. It's a different start point, but the same outcome. They were still cheaper. For apples for apples comparison, even though there's loads more competition in the marketplace, and a lot of that competition were effectively bending over backwards to try and get a banking client, they were still cheaper, which was great. Uh, the proposed solution fit. The apples they were proposing were exactly the shape and color that we were looking for. Um, even though it was different to previous engagement, the proposal was different. Again, written specifically for the, um, for the RFQ that they were answering. And the confidence. Weirdly, they had a banking client before. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like I could give you the, the reference for that one. Um, but yeah, confidence. They had actually showed they'd understood the requirements. Again, they went beyond suggesting amendments and alternatives. Always good to hear. Uh, they were also one of the very few companies, as I say, that actually implemented an open banking solution in Europe. And obviously, with some of the people from banks, that's, that's quite key when you're looking at uh, um, a, a new supplier is have you actually uh, delivered in a bank before. It is of every other banking client I've spoken to anyway. Um, so, yeah, um, just to obviously give you the delivery path of the second uh, iteration, it's going well. It's still delivering, but uh, we're looking at delivery mid-jam. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, we'll be in line with uh, the, the SEA requirement date of March, which would be brilliant. So... Why even choose Open Bank in UK as a standard? So this is me basically going, you know, why do we even choose ba uh, Open Bank in UK? Why didn't I bother with the, the Berlin Group or STET or the Polish API or even an in-house creation? And it mainly was, at the time of implementation, Open Bank in UK standard had provided the best fit to requirements. Simple. Um, within those particular examples. Um, it was the most mature standard at the time, and it was a standard rather than just a mere framework. No, I'm not saying frameworks aren't great, but when you're trying to deal with fast delivery in a small organization, having something that's actually formalized is, is always good. Um, also, with Brexit, I'm not saying Brexit's going to end PSD2, by the way. It's probably going to make it worse, uh, but there will be a level of divergence. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, the FCA are fully committed to open banking. So without PSD2, we're still doing open banking as, uh, you know, as banks. It's, we can't really get around it. Um, I will say, though, um, open banking is not per a perfect fit for all scenarios. Um, I've spoken uh, to um, some other banks, and I mean, obviously, if you're a large retail bank, you, you probably fit open banking very, very well. If you're a specialist bank, um, and some of your products may be fit into the PS2 camp, but you actually want to have greater di digitalization. You might think, actually, open banking doesn't necessarily fit my product portfolio and my customers. So really do evaluate it. Um, luckily, in the two scenarios I've, I've said, open banking was a perfect fit. It was perfect in version one. It's still perfect in version two. We think it will still be perfect in version three. So brilliant. But do your homework. Just, you know, as I say to people, if you're having to invest the money in everything else, make sure you choose the right standard for you. But it's always open banking UK, more often than not, uh, no matter which country you're from.
Uh, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, ring an endorsement. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've said that bit, haven't I? Come on, let's go to the next one. <laughs> so, just following on from, obviously, uh, Seshika's session, you know, are we too late? Now, I didn't know she was going to put that in her pack. I assume she's stolen it from mine. Um, but she's got figures and everything else. It's nice to know that the vendor is standing up here and going, you know what, you, you reckon you're not going to hit March? Well, actually, we've got a 30-day turnaround. Why can't you hit March? Because you're banks. <laughs> no offense. Um, when it comes to um, my experience at banks, there, there is generally quite a lot of governance. Everybody wants to have a say. And um, I was saying to somebody earlier that you generally have four types of people in a bank. You have the compliance people. They're effectively setting your constraints. You have the people that want to have a say, your products, your market department, that sort of thing. They're setting your requirements. You have your C-level and your board. They're the people that will basically give you the OK. You know, yeah, we'll make a decision for you. And then you've got the doers. The poor people have to pick up everything afterwards. Um, so, you know, oh, I've broken my slide. Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> um, so with March coming up, is there enough time to actually onboard a supplier? So you have to go for the whole procurement, get somebody onto your, uh, your supplier list, maybe go through some level of RFP, RFQ, uh, just to make sure you've got technical comparisons, or at least commercial comparisons, and then just make sure that the, person, you know, the party you're bringing can actually deliver. Um, and That's something that's like you obviously have to decide whether you know there is enough, to, whether we are too late, uh, whether there is enough time to actually implement. Uh, I'm just going to bring up another point I've obviously put on this slide here, probably in the wrong place. I did do this on Friday, very very late. Um, that obviously we've got the application for backup interface exclusion. So you might have to ask yourself, why would you bother implementing an, a standalone and uh, open banking solution? that provides API access, so you, you're building all this, just to have to provide a backup interface. Just to have to basically go, well, your backup interface is use my, um, use my normal online banking channel, which I was trying to avoid having to cripple for TPPs to actually access. Um, the application of backup interface exclusion, I can't tell you what that looks like in terms of the UK. The FCA are form formalizing that process in January. The FCA have said, <laughs> that if you are looking to apply for a backup interface exclusion, do it sooner rather than later, January to March. Because obviously, if you're turned down for your backup interface exclusion, you're going to have to build an alternative as well. Now, I will cover that in the FCA consultation paper from September, uh, it pretty much backed the idea of the, EBA, all the, the whole EBA advice, plus the preferences around Open Banking UK APIs, and they sort of mentioned confirmation of payee. If you go for open banking standard and APIs, and you follow the bits of the consultation paper, you are likely to, unless there's somebody from the FCA here, you are likely to get a backup interface exclusion. Um, but obviously, read more on that. The last thing you want to do is, if you're doing this for compliance sake, it's your full foul, and have to provide a backup interface anyway. Um, and confirmation of payee I've put there. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows about that. It's something that's come quite recently. Um, so confirmation of payee is being pushed by the new payment service organization who have renamed themselves Pay UK. Uh, yeah, I can't keep track either. Um, and as part of the super complaint into um, approved um, push payment scams, they're proposing this new confirmation of payee. Now, I don't have the specs yet. I'll probably get them the next week. You have to have an NDA with the NPSO to, uh, to get the specs. But it's likely to be API-based. Um, when we say likely to come next year, um, the NPSO are looking to have the servicing side, so banks providing servicing side of confirmation of payee by April 2019. And the uh, presentation side by July 2019. So, 
Obviously, if you're still looking at the ideas of APIification and how you're actually going to go about it and how you're going to start interacting with new parties and um, how you're going to start uh, interacting with financial organizations based on upcoming future compliance, you haven't got a lot of time left. And these things are coming. So if you do want, if, if, if you feel that you still want to actually go ahead and go down the open banking route, um, and you want to get it done by March because you're running out of time. You have a lot of work to do. You need to start today. You need to uh, go through your typical procurement processes. Go straight to the request for quotation if possible. You know, let's face it, most of you here probably understand this subject enough to go straight to RFQ. You don't need to do the request for information and request for uh, proposal. Keep the process as short as possible. Review very quickly and get your budget request in fast. Now, I've worked with some financial institutions that, uh, unfortunately, if they want to do a sign-off for budget without going to board, it is, has to be a very, very small amount of money. And generally, these sort of initiatives, they're going to be above that threshold. And boards generally meet monthly. You need to get paper in. It needs to go through various committees to get to, get to your board. You probably need to start that process now. Um, illegal contracts need to be turned around quickly. So I've had instances where we've had uh, two months of legal wrangling just to basically get our legal to agree with somebody else's legal. Shortcut that as much as you can. Where possible, stick to the agreed design. Changes do happen. In, you know, I'm in the business of change. And if you've got parallel project streams and they all interface with each other, you've got dependencies, there is the possibility and risk that the design will change. Try and keep the design ultimately the same. Make sure you're ready for delivery in advance of its starting. That sounds really weird. Why are, we why are we getting ready for delivery in advance of its starting? Because this will hit you hard. These guys, if you choose these guys, work very, very fast. That's why you saw that, um, that quotation thing that Sesh could put up earlier and it's got X amount of days. It looks really, really light, doesn't it? These guys work fast, and you need to be able to pour everything in, facilitate them, make sure they've got desks if, they're, if you want them on site. If they're obviously remote, make sure you've got sufficient remote capabilities to, for them to use. Uh, make sure you've got laptops and things in place. Make sure there's servers built if you're looking at uh, in-house server design. Testing and service introduction. Don't wait till delivery's completed. This is one of the biggest mistakes. You wait till towards the end of delivery completion, then you start your, your internal testing to make sure that it's ready for your, your UAT and, and, and to move into production. Um, your service introduction, you need to get your service teams up to scratch with what this is. This isn't just, um, you know, uh, if that server's working or, you know, that piece of technology is broken or my router's gone. You need to get them on board with the new technology stacks in which they're having to deal with. You're having to... Um, educate the flow from customer complaint or TPP complaint to, to resolution. So on that, I've got two minutes and twelve min uh, sorry two minutes and ten seconds for questions. Anybody? <laughs> no, um, that's fine. Um, here's some frequently asked questions. You know, I'm not available for parties. Honest. Um, if you do feel like you've missed out on the other two sessions by being here, that's because Seshika was late. Uh, they are going to be available online. And uh, you can add me to LinkedIn. Just search for my name. Or alternatively, uh, find someone for more information. That is really the picture of me. That's terrible. I'm hoping that these guys have actually done a better picture of me this year. Yeah, everybody get a picture of that one. Yeah, you know. It's actually going to be available online. You don't need to. <laughs> but if anybody's got a better picture of me, please send it to me. And obviously, thank you um, for listening to my ramblings. Uh, if you want to add me to LinkedIn, feel free. There we go. Thank you.